Simply put, a phi prime capping is just a chemical modification that occurs at the phi prime end of the nascent RNA. Predominantly, it's the mRNA, and it happens during transcription. So if you recall the previous video, this is a co-transcriptional modification. Alright, so in this deep dive video, we will discuss when and what starts this capping process, how exactly it is done, and why it is done. Now if you recall the promoter proximal pausing stage, when we discussed the transition of polymerase from the initiation into elongation, we noted that the serine 5 on the C-terminal domain of the polymerase gets phosphorylated. And the RNA at this stage is around 25 to 50 nucleotides in length. Furthermore, there is a specific protein that is recruited at the polymerase in this stage, which is the DCIF complex, which consists of SPT5 and SPT4. Now, the DCIF at this stage recruits two specific enzymes, the human capping enzymes and a methyltransferase. The HCE, human capping enzyme, specifically recognizes the serine 5-phosphate for landing to a specific position on the RNA polymerase 2. And it is the activity of these two specific enzymes, the capping enzyme and the methyltransferase, that establish the cap on the phi prime end of the RNA. So when we ask the question when and what starts this capping process, it is the pausing of the RNA polymerase and recruitment of these two enzymes at the C-terminal domain of the RNA polymerase. Let's now get into the nitty-gritty part of the enzymatic activities required to form a phi prime cap. Understanding that there are three special enzymatic activities will help you follow the rest of the video easily. The first activity is the RNA triphosphatase, which essentially removes the phosphate. The second is the guanyl transferase, which simply works to transfer a guanosine phosphate. And the third is a methyl transferase, which, as the name suggests, transfers a methyl group. If we look at yeast capping enzymes, there are three separate enzymes for all these activities. They're called CET1, CEG1, and just MTases. But this video is about humans or mammalian systems in general, and we have two enzymes instead of three. Essentially, the triphosphatase and the guanyl transferase activity in humans is done by the same enzyme, and that is known as the human capping enzyme, HCE. And the methyltransferase that we have is not very different from the yeast methyltransferase. This capping enzyme is recruited, as noted before, at the serine 5-phosphate on the C-terminal domain. Just a side detail on the human capping enzyme, the two activities in this enzyme are encoded in two domains, which are separated by a linker. The N-terminal domain has the RNA triphosphatase activity, and the C-terminal domain has the guanyl transferase activity. Now, let's see how these enzymatic activities form the cap. I'm going to zoom in into the 5' prime end of the RNA. I'm going to draw out a rough sketch of the first nucleotide of the RNA. The sugar in the backbone will be this dollar symbol, so that you don't get confused between the S and a 5. The second carbon of this sugar has a hydroxyl group. The third carbon is engaged in a phosphodiester linkage with the next nucleotide that I'm not going to draw out. The fifth carbon of the sugar has the triphosphate, and the first carbon has some nucleobase. It doesn't matter what this nucleobase is. And because this is the first base in the RNA, we'll call this the plus one site. So this is the 5' prime end of the RNA that needs to get capped. The first enzyme in play is the human capping enzyme, and specifically the triphosphatase activity works first, which releases the gamma phosphate from the nucleotide. So now if we draw out the sketch again following this step, we notice that the plus one site has only two phosphates left. As soon as this happens, the guanyl transferase activity of the human capping enzyme is initiated. This sort of coupling of both the activities allows a faster response to capping of the RNA. Now the guanyl transferase has to transfer a guanosine phosphate, which should come from a substrate. In this case, the substrate is a GTP. GTP is just a nucleotide with guanine at the nucleobase. And here's a rough sketch of the GTP. Now from this GTP, the guanyl transferase enzyme part of the human capping enzyme transfers the guanosine with just one phosphate. And the two phosphates at the gamma and the beta positions are released. Now following this transfer, we can draw the modified 5' prime end of the RNA, which has the same first nucleotide. Now it is at the 5' prime end where the transfer of guanosine phosphate occurs. 
The third phosphate here comes from the GTP substrate, and the remainder of the GTP looks the same. Now it is important to note that transfer occurred from 5' prime to a 5' prime end. This triphosphate linkage is quite different from the canonical 5' prime to 3' prime phosphodiester linkages. So now getting more specific about notations, we've said that this is the plus one site, and this transferred GTP is the site zero. Okay, so now human capping enzyme has done its job, which is to remove a phosphate and second to transfer the guanosine phosphate to the 5' prime end of the nascent RNA. After capping enzyme is done, the methyl transferase takes over and is ready to perform its task. Oftentimes, you may also find that there are two oxy methyl transferases. We will look into that in just a moment. But for this third step, it is the methyl transferase that is going to transfer a methyl group to the GTP at the site zero. So where does the methyl come from? The substrate for this enzyme is called S-adenosyl-L-methionine. For short, you can call it SAM or Adomet. To give you some extra details, the Adomet is very similar to an adenosine nucleoside, where the fifth carbon of the sugar has a methionine attached. The methionine, you may already know, is an amino acid. In this linkage, the methyl group is present on this sulfur and this is what gets transferred. Now Adomet goes into this reaction as a substrate, the methyl group is removed from the Adomet, and it turns into S-adenosyl L-homocysteine, which is abbreviated as SAH or edoh -psi. Okay, so that is all about the substrate. And now let's draw out the product of this step, starting with the plus one site of the ARNA, which remains unchanged, but from step two as we saw that it is now linked to a guanosine phosphate, with this 5 to 5 triphosphate linkage. But following this step of methyl transfer, it is the nitrogen in the position 7 of the guanine that gets the methyl group. And that's the methylation of site 0 that completes the cap. And because this transfer of methyl group occurs at the 7th nitrogen, the cap structure can be written in shorthand as 5 prime M7 GP. Now on top of that, because the methyl only exists in this specific cap in site 0, we call this cap a cap 0. To complete the notation of the RNA, we can now represent the plus 1 site as PPN. The two phosphates are written here because we have to complete the triphosphate linkage, and the second nucleotide has a normal phosphodiester linkage, so you get a PN. Now that's a typical 5' prime cap, which you may already know about. Now sometimes, a 2-oxymethyl transferase can transfer a methyl group to the hydroxyl on the second carbon of the plus 1 nucleotide on top of a cap 0 structure. And this reaction also takes an edomet as the substrate, and the reaction and the transfer of the methyl is quite the same. Now the notation for this sort of cap is the same as cap 0, except that the methyl is transferred in the plus 1 site, as denoted by this dot. And we call this cap where both site 0 and plus 1 site are methylated a cap 1. Now that's not the end. The 2-oxymethyl transferase can in some extreme cases transfer the methyl group to the second carbon of the second site of the RNA. So you get site 0, site 1, and site 2 methylated. And this sort of cap is known as cap 2. Now as for the location, the cap 0 and cap 1 modification occur in the nuclei. The cap zero is canonical and it is strictly co-transcriptional. It has to be present in all mRNAs. The cap one can be either post or co-transcriptional. Now cap two specifically occurs in the cytoplasm only, which means that it is strictly speaking a post-transcriptional modification. If you look at lower eukaryotes like yeast, you will only find cap zero. It doesn't have cap one or cap two. But in higher eukaryotes, mammals for instance, can have cap1 and cap2 modifications present in their RNAs. Now that we understand the when, what, and how the 5' prime end capping is done, let's discuss why capping is important. You may already have a partial answer for this, but I'm going to give you a much more extensive explanation. Now, the capping is done on this moving RNA polymerase, and since it is still in transcription, you can only have the zero or the plus one site methylated. Now this cap is maintained by the cell, and the polymerase continues into elongation. But the capping enzymes oftentimes tend to remain bound as the RNA polymerase moves. These enzymes can remain bound for as long as 1 kb. 
but these capping enzymes must be released from the moving RNA polymerase, especially before termination. The human capping enzyme and the methyltransferase release is very important. Now, why is that? So now if you look into the termination step and the polymerase, where let's go with the example of poly A termination. We saw that the poly A signal is recognized and the RNA is cleaved off. Now, if capping enzymes are present along with this polymerase at the termination step where the RNA cleavage has occurred, they can actually cap this cleaved RNA again. After capping, we would have stabilized this cleaved RNA, and the XRN2 cannot perform this exonucleus digestion step because this cap blocks the exoribonucleus activity. As a consequence now, the RNA polymerase will also fail to terminate. So capping is an important time-sensitive step for the stability of the RNA. Now, going back to the original capping stage, when this cap is formed, it is immediately stabilized by proteins known as cap-binding complexes, which are usually cap-binding protein 20 or 80. These cap-binding proteins are very important because they help in the export of the RNA from the nuclei into the cytoplasm. They interact with the nuclear pore complex and take the processed RNA from the nucleus out into the cytoplasm. Now, as soon as the cap-binding proteins exit the nuclei, they are replaced by cytoplasmic proteins, which is usually the eukaryotic initiation factor 4E, which is a factor required for translation initiation. Binding of initiation factor is important for efficient translation of the mRNA. So to sum up our discussion, the capping is important for the following reasons. It is important for the export of the RNA. It prevents the RNA from exonucleus digestion. It stabilizes the RNA, and it signals the promoter proximally paused polymerase to go into elongation. And we just also saw that it is required for an efficient translation initiation. Something that I haven't really touched here is that capping also helps in the process of splicing of the RNA. And it is usually the promoter proximal introns that get the help. And this can be done in either co- or post-transcriptional manner. Another important reason for capping the RNA is to enable immunity, whereby these cells can distinguish foreign RNA through the presence or absence of a phi prime cap. The viral RNAs usually tend to lack a phi prime cap, so the cells can oftentimes just digest the viral RNA, and that's a smart way of reducing potential viral infections. And that wraps up this video.